I invite your attention to 1 John chapter 5 for a message this morning. First John chapter 5. While, while we were living in, in Grenada, there was an older missionary couple there as well. And we were living, my family and I were at the Limes, and he was at a different location. And even though that was the case, he was a man that I, I sometimes referred to him as my, my dad while in the mission field. Now, this goes back to 2002, 3, and 4, and my parents were both alive at the time, so my dad was still living, but I referred to this man as my dad while on the mission field. And this man was an older man, but he was a full of energy. And uh, it, when you uh, work with, with this man, you had to keep things stepping or he could easily outwork you, although he was a good bit older. And this man's name... Uh, is John Brubaker. And now the days of Grenada are over 14 years behind us, so I'm going to fast forward the story until Tuesday of this week. On Tuesday of this week, I had a, a sales appointment in Reading. One o'clock, I was supposed to meet this gentleman in Reading, and after my appointment, leading up to Tuesday, I, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, you should stop in and visit John Brubaker. So looking at my schedule a little bit, and 1 o'clock in Reading, I can, I can make this work. So after my appointment there, I, uh, I stopped at John's house. And on Tuesday, John was not working. And I, I, was, I knew I could find John at home. And you see, the reason for this is that John has cancer. And when I got there, he was lying there in his bed. Life ha is changing for, for John and his, his wife, Rachel. And he's, they told me it's been two weeks now since he has been out of the house. And in our, our little short conversation, they said, yeah, they sold, John had a little pickup that he used to use for work, and they sold that. They were aware that he wouldn't need that any longer. And I sat there in the chair, and I said, John, how are things going? And his, this was his answer, and I quote, John said, Not too bad, but things will be much better on the other side. Now this was Tuesday, I repeat, and John had a smile on his face. His mind was still very sharp, and we talked for a while, probably longer than I, I should have been there, but before long, two of his grandsons showed up, and I said goodbye, and I left. And I headed for the front door, and his wife Rachel was there. And when I got there, she made this comment. She said, and I quote, not everyone has an opportunity like this. She said, um, let me stop for a second, referring to how people are coming and visiting. She said a lot of people come and visit, especially on Sunday afternoons. And she said this. Not everybody has an opportunity like this. This is like a viewing before the viewing. And I was taken back by both their comments, that they're just talking so openly about death. John and Rachel both know that his life is short, and their granddaughter, which is Marita Weaver, Spencer's wife, said this last Sunday. We were at Shenandoah. So Marita told my wife that they do not expect him to see the holidays. Now, this is November ready, and the holidays are coming right up. Oh, and a while back, I believe it was Pastor Jim said, if you want to go see John Brubaker, you better go now. And so that is what I did on Tuesday. And although they both understand that his life is short, there was a peace in their home on Tuesday that was clearly, clearly evident. And it was hard for me, as I, I, I mentioned here how, what I remember John being like in Grenada, just energetic. And it was hard for me to see him laying there in that bed that they brought in for him to use. And it was even harder for me to drive away knowing that I may never see him again on this side of eternity. About a little over an hour ago, 
Randy Good dismissed us for Sunday school class, and I got out of my bench, and there I met Sylvan, and he said, hey, did you hear that John Brubaker died? I said, well, wait a minute. I said, I'm talking about John in my message this morning. Then after Sunday school, uh, they showed me the obituary. John died yesterday. John and Rachel Brubaker, I don't know if, if how many of you know him. Uh, I think he served at least 11 years in Grenada, possibly more. He was back and forth uh, a couple times. But on Tuesday, John and Rachel were both very calm and talking with smiles on their face. And I asked just a few questions to get us thinking here. How is this possible? Which I think you know the answer. Is death normally this easy? And I think you know the answer. And what about the other side that John was talking about? The message title is, That You May Know. Let's look at John. You have your, we got some Johns mixed up here. John Brubaker's a man who died yesterday, and the Apostle John is who wrote this passage that we're going to look at this morning. So you're going to hear John named a couple times this morning, but just so you can uh, stay with me, you know who I'm talking about. That You May Know, point number one, John 5:13. John 5, 1 John 5, 13, I'm sorry, that these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. John is writing this letter to, to the Christians, to the believers. He said, these things... What is he talking about? He's referring to a few things he mentioned in the previous chapters. Uh, John 1, verse 7, the walking in the light, he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. The, these things refer to that one there. Another one is in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Next one is that we obey the Lord's command. Chapter 2, verses uh, 3, 4, and 5. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected, thereby know we that we are in him. And also, the things he's talking about is loving the brethren. In chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 9 and 10. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. And also, these things is also that we... Uh, he's talking about is that we can believe that Jesus is the Christ. Chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar? But he, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And verse 23. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So these things is what some of the things that we read there. But John is writing to those who believe on the name of the Son of God. Those who are genuinely seeking to follow the Lord in these areas that were mentioned. And those who are committed to continually living according to the Word of God. He, John's saying to the believers, people who know God's Word and are steadfastly adhering to it. So if this is describing you this morning then according to the, to the word of God, this is saying that then you too may know that the eternal life is waiting for you. And brothers and sisters, as I look at this, this is how John Brubaker could say on Tuesday afternoon with a calm voice. He said, things will be better on the other side. This is John, his testimony lives on, but he, it's uh, the apostle John as well as Mr. Brubaker there are telling us this morning that believers can know that we have the assurance of salvation. We can know. We can be perfectly assured that we have eternal life and knowing without a shadow of a doubt. And how? John gives us three ways. Number one, eternal life. We receive eternal life by heeding to the scriptures. And John here is writing uh, his, his, his reason for the letter. I'm writing to let you know 
that eternal life is waiting, and we can know that. Peace on the deathbed comes from knowing that eternal life is waiting for us on the other side. Let me explain quickly uh, a few things that was not in the Brubaker home on Tuesday afternoon. Now, these are a few things that were not there. Number one, I sure hope I have eternal life. Number two, comments like, I hope God will accept me, or I think I've done enough of good deeds to inherit it home on the other side. They were not there. It was absent. None of that stuff was there. And also, allow me to add, they, were, they weren't sitting there wringing their hands and nervously fidgeting. There was a peace. Earlier in my notes I had, it was a peace that was hard to describe. I like to describe as best as I could. People just sitting there just in complete peace. And John lay in there right beside, knowing that life was short and he passed away yesterday. There was assurance in his voice when John said what he said, that things are going to be better on the other side. Number two, we can receive eternal life by believing on the name of Jesus Christ. And very, very, putting in a nutshell, we can say, eternal life is reserved for the people who believe on the Son of God. In my studies, some one place I read that said some people prefer to end verse 13 with the word life, that you may know you have eternal life, and they end it there. But unto you that believe in the name of of the Son of God, that that point is stressed in the original language. Eternal life is contingent on personal trust in Christ. Eternal life is contingent on personal trust in Christ. Jesus said. Uh, John, 4, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he added, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Folks, the, the gospel message is not complicated. I think I mentioned that before. Sometimes we think it is, or sometimes we even try to, comp- to complicate it. But believing in Jesus Christ is the only way to reach God. We're talking about eternal life, and the only way there is through Jesus Christ. To believe is to put the fullest trust in the name of Christ so that everything that we have, nothing else matters than our trust in Jesus Christ. And that's the reason that Jesus tells us over and over again that we need to deny self, our own selves. That needs to be squashed. We need to get rid of that. Because following Christ begins by unloading our backpack of fear and doubt and self and knowing full well that when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, he is able to supply our every need as we follow him. And as we get to this point in our life where we completely put our complete trust in Christ and we believe in him, you know what's happening? We are building confidence in Christ. We are building our confidence in Christ. We're so self-centered and independent. we we, we got to do everything on our own. No, we take that whole mentality and we throw it out and we build confidence in Christ. Then when we're faced with a victory and we, with, I'm sorry, when we're faced with a temptation and we experience victory, it draws us yet closer and closer and closer to Christ because we know in our own strength we cannot do it, so we put our complete confidence and our trust in Christ. And the third one we want to look at as we receive eternal life by continuing to believe on the name of Jesus. So like we mentioned here, John was writing to the believers. But here we see him stressing the point that we must continue to believe. We must endure in our faith and keep on believing and keep on believing until the Lord returns or like the blessing that John Brubaker had, the Lord calls us home. We must persevere and endure in our faith. Matthew 10, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Okay, believers this morning, you're going to be hated. Words of Christ. But he didn't stop there, he said, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Being hated is not a pleasant feeling, however, is to be expected. Jesus said so. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, when do you think the Lord's going to return? That's been years ago people have been talking about that. That's never going to happen. Yes, it is. So being a Christian, is, uh, being hated, is something that is to be expected. And it's not grounds for losing faith. Oh, I'm hated? Okay, I'll, I'll drop my faith and go follow the ways of the world. No, because it says only those who endure to the end is going to experience a home on the other side that John was talking about. 
So as a believer this morning, are you steadfast in your faith to Christ? Are you going to endure? The promises in God's word are for those who do that. Hebrews 10, uh, 10, 22, and 23, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, we're drawing closer and closer. We talk about that. We're building confidence. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. I love it. You remember back to the day you became a Christian and your Christian journey started from there as a babe in Christ. We're continuing to step through, step by step, day by day. But we're holding fast to our profession of faith and we're not going to waver, not even if we are being hated. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a profession that we should, be, that we should consider as precious. I've told you before, in, in my job, I sell uh, post and frame buildings, and I get out, and people want a garage to put their car in, and they put their boat in, and so uh, men like to hold on to old cars, or uh, I don't hear a lot of it, but some men like to hold on to guns. Yeah, I was at a place one time, he took me into his basement and opened a, a big door, and inside, behind that, a safe door, he opened that up, the real thick door, and it was an entire room. And this whole way around the room was lined with guns. Like, wow. Men like to hold on to that. And some people we hear like to hold on to family heirlooms. If you're there, I'm not uh, contradicting you. I'm just saying. Some people like to hold on to family heirlooms as something they consider pri priceless. But what are, we, what are we looking at here this morning? We're to hold on to our faith in Christ as something that is of utmost value. Something we will not let go of. Family heirlooms can burn. And cars can get crashed and can, and burn as well, but our faith in Christ is to endure until the end. Verses four, uh, 14 and 15, some very important statements on prayer. And this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have, put, have the petitions that we desired of him. So this Important, these statements on prayer come right on the heels of those who believe in the name of Jesus. Those who have a relationship with Christ. Those who cherish their time of communicating with Him. Assurance of salvation, as we saw in verse 13, leads us to confidence in petition. Remember, we're building our confidence in Christ. Prayer could be looked at as an exercise of the spiritual life that is as certain in its results as is the character of the true and living God. I think we need to daily remember the vital importance that we have in prayer. Those who, have, those who by faith have the Son of God as their Savior can have great confidence as we approach God in prayer. And we do that any time and anywhere. The bulletin says to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That does not need a lot of expla explaining there. That's, that comes, it's easy to understand. So the confidence we see in verse 14 speaks of boldness. And here again, we're built more on that confidence that uh, uh, we're built more and more in our confidence in Christ. And then the here in verse 15 has the idea of hearing favorably. So what are these verses saying? It is not saying that a Christian gets everything that they ask for. Our prayers need to be offered in Jesus' name. They need to come from an upright life and not ask with self selfish motives. Effectual prayer is according to his will. Prayer is, should not be considered as an attempt to get God to see things our way. Nor should we ask that we can get all those things that we have decided we need or want. Prayer is learning to say, your will be done, as Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. In verses, moving on to verses 16 and 17, we see how sin has gripped the world, and believers are called to pray for the sinners, lift them up to God, praying for their repentance. And return to a correct relationship with God. As we see in the end of verse 17, uh, in verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. For the second point, we're going to go to verse 18, and that is keeping himself. 
I'm sorry, the verse says, keepeth himself. Verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth toucheth him not. So those who we are talking about that back in verse 13, those who believe on the the Son of God, you see we see they will not sin. Is this saying that all believers are going to be perfect? John is saying the believer will not make a habit of sin in their life. Temptations will come, and we need to be on guard. Back in Ephesians 6, with armed with the armor of God. And if we fall, what's our response? Immediately run to God, confess and repent. So what are we looking at? We are to strive for perfection. That's to be our goal, strive for perfection. And as we do this, we will, all, we will grow closer and closer to God. Perfection is our goal. But however, as we go through our lives, striving for that, God is there, ready and willing to forgive our sins when we ask Him. When we commit a sin and then confess and repent and clear it up, that is vastly different from continuing to indulge and living within the grip of sin. So yes, we're living in a day of grace, but we need to be very careful we don't continue to live in sin. Victory over sin lies within. I repeat, victory over sin lies within. The clause, he who has been born of God keeps himself, speaks of the new nature which excludes holiness. So think about it. When we accept Jesus Christ as a Savior, what happens? We're cleansed from our past sin. We're washed clean, sanctified. The uh, process of justification begins. We are made as if we had never sinned, justified, and plus we are given a new nature. And while this is great and exciting, the reason our holiness is excluded from that is because if we on our own strength could live sinless, holy lives, then we would become even more individualistic, thinking, well, we can attain salvation on our own merits. But holiness in our lives is possible because of Jesus Christ, who is our new master. So yes, When we accept Christ, a lot of things happen, but we need to be like John 15, tap into that vine for holiness and remain there and abide there and live there and obediently live our lives for him. We can look at it this way. Those in Christ are kept from sin. Jesus keeps the believer from from making the habit of living in sin. So when you are content in Christ, we're not going to be indulging in the lust of the flesh. When we are in Christ, we are protected from the evil one. This does not mean the believer never sin again. The word touch there in verse 18 means lay hold of, grasp, and grip. So if you are living in Christ, you're not going to be within the grasp or the grip or the chains of sin that Satan was trying to keep you in. And on top of it all, Jesus Christ keeps his eye upon those who truly trust in him. The blessings of being a Christian just continue to abound over and over and over again. And what we have here is the idea that Satan cannot touch a believer to harm him. So the genuine believer is under the keeping power of Christ, and we know that our sins are covered by his blood. Proverbs 13, 6, the first part of the verse says, Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way. How does this work? Well, when a temptation comes our way, if we are in Christ and our relationship with Christ is good, when a temptation comes our way, brothers and sisters, this is what we do. We say no. We can't fall there because we're in Christ. We can't do that, go there, whatever it may be, because we are in Christ. Proverbs 133 says, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. What a promise. When we hearken unto the Lord, we're going to dwell safely and be quiet from the fear of evil. Just two verses there to help us understand how the Lord watches over his children. Verse 19, how does the believer conquer and live victoriously over sin? Verse 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Quite a verse. The whole world lieth in and wickedness. So how can we conquer and live in victory? And what we see there is by knowing that the world is in opposition to God. 
The world lies under the power of darkness. What was this past Thursday? Halloween. Remember last week's message? We weren't here, but I heard it. I listened to it on, on the website. Halloween is not of God. All kinds of darkness. Friday, I was in Jersey. A young man was there with his, his baby. He said, yeah, I came home from work early yesterday to take my daughter Halloween. She might have been, I don't know, three or four months old. Uh, it's like, oh, my word, I can already believe it. I think, I don't know, I think sometimes people separate going from door to door and getting candy different from the, the, the actual, the evil that is in Halloween, but nonetheless, we cannot become, we cannot be involved in anything of that. There is so much wickedness, and I think it's getting worse and worse, as Ray alluded to the fact last Sunday in his message as well. Halloween is not of God, and not just Halloween, but the world and then the darkness there, when we understand the principle of the world being dark, and we know we're not supposed to get involved in the things of the world, we are aware that we are to separate ourselves from the worldliness and live lives that are fully surrendered to God. And you could say, why? And the answer is here, because we are born of God. And it says, we know we are of God. As a believer, we know we are of God. Remember, we left our, when we became a Christian, we left our all the doubts behind, and we are confident of who we are. First John 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We separate ourselves from that. That's, things of the world are not of God. We know that we are of God, verse 19, and the whole, whole world lieth in wickedness. We were called out. We're separate. Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Where are we at? We're not dampering and dabbling with the things of darkness. Point number three, eternal life, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know that he is true and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now back, look back at the verses that we just read well, this morning thus far. And look at the words, we know. Verse 13, verse 15, verse 18, verse 19, and twice in verse 20. We know. We know. Can we understand the confidence that John was writing with here? We know Jesus came. And by his coming, as God in human flesh, we are able to know the true God. And we are able to have fellowship with him. God sent his son to give us understanding of some of these things and to lead us to the true God. <coughs> Deliverance from sin is not found in understanding psychology, medicine, education, and so on. While all these things have their place in society, there is one understanding that can deliver us from sin. And that is the spiritual understanding that Jesus Christ gives. Jesus Christ came and he gives spiritual insight so that we can understand and know. We'll start with three things or possibly more. Jesus Christ gives us the knowledge of God to know that God is true, to know that God ex does exist, to know that God is behind all things. He is the uh, the maker and creator of all things, that is the God that we serve. And Jesus Christ came to give us that understanding. Secondly, Jesus Christ gives us knowledge that we are in God and in his Son. We have been born of God. We are secure forever in him and in his Son, Jesus Christ, because we are in the very divine nature of God himself. The blessings are just poured out upon us here when we accept Christ as our Savior and look to who Jesus, understand who he really is. And the third thing, he gives us knowledge so we can know the true God who lives eternally. You know, we don't have to live in doubt. We can have, according to verse 13, we can have that assurance of salvation. We, have, we are in him, and those who are in Christ have been promised eternal life, which means we will never die spiritually, but we'll live forever and ever with God. John 17, 3. 
And this is eternal life, that you, uh, here it is again, might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Today, I think we are living in a day of confusion. Many people are, are searching for the truth and looking in various places. But this morning, as children of God, we need to look no farther. For the God we serve is the God of truth. And back to John 14, 6, I read a verse earlier, but Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. I think the truth gets muffled today and people try to twist it, but Jesus says, I am the truth. This is a true God and eternal life. And the last point, point five, verse 5, is keep yourselves. First, in verse 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. Why, may I ask, did John tack this verse on the end of this letter? After all the confidence and assurance that he filled us with, he says, beware of idols. Well, what is an idol? An idol is anything that takes first place in a person's life, anything that a person puts before God. Anything that consumes man's focus and concentration, consumes his energy and efforts more than his devotion to God. Avoid giving devotion to idols. Alfred Plumer said this, that in Ephesus, every street through which John's readers walked and every heathen house they visited was swarmed with idols. And maybe that's why John wrote that to his readers back in the day, but I think it applies to us today. We need to avoid giving devotion to idols. The confidence that the Apostle John was writing about in verse 14 is evident through the rest of these verses. And this confidence in Christ, and knowing that we can look forward to the day where we can meet God face to face and live forever in eternity, that confidence is not found in a half-hearted commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That confidence is not found when we allow the things of this world to consume part or all of our attention. I believe it's God's desire that we can have within that assurance of salvation. He doesn't want us to live in doubt, but know that we can be saved. And I think John's letter here helps us understand and how to attain that confidence. But God is a jealous God. And God, he demands our full surrender. To know him as he is causes love and obedience to be the redeeming, worshipful response that God intends for them to be. To love him as he is just makes a difference in our lives. And the peace and confidence in the Brewbreaker home on Tuesday afternoon was not one of doubt. And although he passed away, I repeat, John very clearly said, these things will be better on the other side where he is today. He spoke with confidence, knowing full well that he was right with God. And there were no idols that were hindering his relationship with God. Earlier... I realized I had prepared this, and I heard just this morning that my illustration had passed away, but earlier as I was studying this, some of these, what I've written, you have to kind of read between the lines because he now has, has died. But the doctors had told John that his days are numbered. And we had heard this a long time ago, and I have a question for you this morning. Would you have the peace that I attempt to describe in the Brewbreaker's home that they have, would you have that peace if the doctor told you that you have six months to live? I think John left behind quite a testimony. Church, we're not even promised that we're going to be live this evening. And I'm well aware that death is sad for those left behind. But according to the Word of God, I'm also aware, aware, aware sorry, that it's a glorious, most wonderful time for those going home, for those who are ready and prepared and waiting to meet their master. As I was studying this week, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that I did when I was a teenager. And that 30 plus years ago, it was something I had forgotten about for years and suddenly I felt convicted to go and make it right. And I was thinking about this at work, and 
I was nervous about going talking to the person because it's been a long time and also I wonder how they're going to respond. Something then told me I need to go and take care of it. And it was also a voice that said, I'll just let it go. Let it, it'll be all right. So I went back. I called him. And I said, are you home? I said, can I stop in for a few minutes? Sure. And I confessed it. And they looked at me. And they said, they don't remember a thing. So I asked for and I received forgiveness. And what just thanking God ever since for the for forgiveness and what it, what it can do to us. And I'm thankful I got it off my, off my chest. But someday, we're all going to stand before God. And he is that, that true and that righteous judge. And we're going to be there. Are we going to be there? Are you going to be there in fear? Or will you be there with confidence? Knowing God and knowing that things will be better on the other side. We can have that full confidence and assurance of eternal life when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are in a right standing with God. The Holy Spirit leads something to you that you did, I think it was 32 or even more years ago. Go back and take care of it. When that day comes and we stand before him, we don't want anything hindering, hindering us, anything that he's going to say, would you remember this? Did you make that right? But we want to hear them, them words, welcome home, my faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Let's pause for prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning. Just thank you, God, for your word. And thank you, Lord, for the assurance of salvation that believers can have with you. Thank you, Lord, for the way the Holy Spirit speaks in our hearts and our lives through a still, small voice, through convicting us through our conscience. Lord, if there's any souls here this morning who have not known you, I pray they can make that decision before it's too late. If there's anyone here this morning that needs to go back and apologize, I pray you give them the strength to do that. If there's anyone here this morning who has anything hindering them, from you welcome them home into eternal life. I pray they can make that right before it is too late. And I too pray for the John Brubaker family this morning. May you just be ever so close to them, God. Thank you for the testimony that he left behind. And thank you, Lord, that we can know without assurance, of, without any doubt, that things will be better on the other side. Thank you again for leading us through this worship time. And we just want to bless you and give you honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Song, please, Damien.